Take one, subtract a third, add a fifth, subtract a seventh, add a ninth, and so on forever, alternating adding and subtracting one divided by all the odd numbers, and you get this, which happens to be equal to pi over four. Definitely a pretty sweet result, though we won't dwell now on why pi shows up here. It would be a tangent. But now let's rearrange these terms a little bit to make a different looking infinite series. Take the first two positive terms, one and one fifth, and then put the first negative term, negative one third, after them. Then tack on the next two positive terms, one ninth and one thirteenth, and follow them both with the next negative term, negative a seventh. And keep going, always adding the next two positive terms, followed by the next single negative term, in the pattern plus plus minus plus plus minus, and so on. And we get... Ew, not the same thing? Wait, what? That can't be right. This new infinite sum is just a rearrangement of the terms of the first infinite sum. We didn't add any external terms, and we didn't omit any terms from the original series. Did I make some mistake? Let's get the computer to check. If I get the computer to add up the first 10,000 terms of both series, it looks like they're still converging to different sums. So is this some kind of issue with computer arithmetic or something? Or am I playing some other kind of trick? Actually, there's no trick and no computer error. The difference between these sums is real. How is this possible? We took the series 1 minus a third plus a fifth and so on and rearranged the terms in the pattern plus plus minus plus plus minus and we got a new series whose sum was pretty clearly different from what we started with. This seems to indicate that you can rearrange the order you add up numbers and get a different answer. Which, of course, is in complete defiance of all our intuitions about how adding works. I mean, if you have three apples, five apples, and seven apples, all in separate containers, you have 15 apples total, regardless of whether you add them up as 3 plus 5 plus 7, or 7 plus 3 plus 5, or whatever other order you want. And that's definitely always true. If you're dealing with a finite number of terms. The issue here, as you might have guessed, is with the transition from adding a finite number of terms to adding an infinite number of terms. For a finite number of terms, it certainly does not matter what order you add them. You'll always get the same sum. However, an infinite sum does care about the order you add the terms, or at least it sometimes cares. It's one of the many examples of things that break down when you take them to infinity. But even so, why does this happen? Even with an infinite number of terms, how can you change the sum if you only rearrange the terms? We'll get into how this can happen shortly, but actually, you should know that we've understated the weirdness here so far. After seeing that we could change the sum of this one series just by rearranging the terms, you might ask what other alternative sums there could be. And can this happen with all infinite series, or just some of them? If only some, which ones? Well, the answer is pretty unexpected, to put it mildly. It turns out not all series are susceptible to this. Some series never change their sum no matter how you rearrange their terms. But there's a whole other class of series where the sum can change, and can even change by a lot. Like, a whole lot. In fact, for this special type of series, you can change their sum to be any real number you want just by rearranging the terms. Take a moment to let that sink in, because if you understood what I just said, it should come across to you as what mathematicians call completely nuts. For example, you remember the series 1 minus a third plus a fifth and so on that we were looking at before? It's one of these special series, and so not only could you change its sum to be this one alternative, but you could change it to be one half, or square root of one half, or pi, or negative a billion or literally any other real number you want, just by rearranging the terms in just the right way. This crazy idea is known more formally as the Riemann series theorem, or the Riemann rearrangement theorem. And by the end of this video, my hope is that this crazy idea will feel completely sensible to you, and maybe even kind of obvious. But first things first. I said this only works for some series. Which ones exactly? The answer is the so-called conditionally convergent series, 
which means series with a mix of both positive and negative terms that have a finite sum, but which kind of depend on having a mix of positive and negative terms to make their sum finite. Meaning, if you make all the terms of the series positive, that is, you take the absolute value of each individual term before adding them, the series no longer has a finite sum and will diverge to infinity. Our old pi over 4 series, with its alternating reciprocal odd numbers, is an example of a conditionally convergent series. If you make every term positive, the series will diverge to infinity, albeit very slowly. This is in contrast to the so-called absolutely convergent series, which are series that have a finite sum, but do so regardless of the signs of the terms. If you make all the terms of an absolutely convergent series positive, the sum may change, but it will still be finite. It turns out these series are immune to having their sums changed by rearranging terms, which makes them useful for certain purposes since they're so well behaved. So the claim of the Riemann series theorem is that any conditionally convergent series can have its sum changed to literally any real number merely by rearranging the terms in just the right way. But how exactly do we rearrange the terms to achieve a given target sum? Well, there's actually a very simple but clever trick to construct such a rearrangement. To explain it, having some visuals will be a real help. Picture the terms of a series as being a collection of upward and downward pointing arrows, with upward arrows representing positive terms and downward arrows representing negative terms with their lengths set to match the magnitude of their corresponding terms. You can then picture adding up the terms by placing the arrows tip to tail in a chain, where the tail of the first arrow is placed at the origin of some grid. The y-coordinate of the tip of the last arrow you place on the chain represents the value of a partial sum of the series, and the total sum of the series is just the location this final tip approaches as you tack on more and more arrows from the series. So let's say we start with some arbitrary, conditionally convergent series. Since we're going to be rearranging the terms of this series, there's no reason to keep them in any particular order right now. So as a first step, let's separate the positive terms from the negative terms. Now, in both subsets, rearrange the terms so that they're in descending order of magnitude. That is, rearrange all the arrows in both groups, starting from the longest arrow, followed by the next longest, and so on. Seems simple enough, but we've actually already hit a snag. To do this, we had to assume there really is a longest upward arrow and a longest downward arrow. But does there have to be? Remember, we're dealing with an infinite list of arrows here, so why can't there be arbitrarily long arrows in addition to arbitrarily short ones in the list? The answer is because we assumed at the beginning that this series is conditionally convergent. In this case, forget the conditional part. We only need the fact that it converges. In other words, that the series has a finite sum. If an infinite series has a finite sum, then the individual terms of the series must approach zero. If they approached anything else, even something very small, it would mean in the long run that the series would eventually look like repeatedly adding the same non-zero number to itself over and over forever, which would ultimately make the series diverge to infinity. So if the terms of the series are approaching zero, there can't be an infinite sequence of terms growing larger and larger hiding among them, because any subsequence of terms must, eventually, become small. Thus, there must be a largest positive term and a largest negative term. Okay, with that out of the way, there are two more properties about both of these lists that we need to establish. The first is that both lists are infinitely long, going on forever, and the second is that the sequence of terms in both lists approach zero. If we take the first property, that both lists are infinitely long, for granted, the second property is actually an immediate consequence of convergence. Since the original series converged, its sequence of terms has to approach zero, which means any sequence of terms we construct from them also has to approach zero. But what about the first property? How do we know both lists are infinitely long to begin with? That is, how do we know that we have infinitely many positive terms and infinitely many negative terms? 
For all we know, the original series might have only had a finite number of, say, negative terms, while having infinitely many positive terms. Why do we have to have infinitely many of each? To answer that, we now have to bring the conditional part of conditional convergence back into the picture. Remember that conditional convergence means the series does converge, in other words, has a finite sum, but if you make all the negative terms positive, it would then diverge, having an infinite sum. But if the series only had a finite number of negative terms, you couldn't make the series diverge just by turning those negative terms positive, because changing only finitely many terms of a series can't make a finite sum infinite, or vice versa. To be sure, you might change the sum of the series quite a bit if the negative terms were quite large, but you still can't make a finite sum infinite unless you change infinitely many terms. Thus, both lists of positive and negative terms must be infinite in length. So with all of this groundwork in place, we are now ready to prove the Riemann series theorem. But before diving in, let's briefly summarize what we've got so far. We started with some conditionally convergent series, and separated its positive and negative terms into two separate, infinitely long lists. We then rearranged both lists into descending order, starting with each list's biggest term, and determined that the long-term behavior of both lists is to approach zero. All of this was possible because we assumed the original series to be conditionally convergent. Okay, so using these terms, let's say we want to construct a rearranged series whose sum is s, where s can be any number you want. Visually, the goal here is to construct an infinite chain of arrows, where the tail-to-tip sequence approaches the horizontal line y equals s, and do so using all the arrows, and only the arrows, in these two lists. I encourage you to pause here if you want, and see if you can come up with a strategy to do this on your own. Alright, so here's how we'll approach this here. First, let's assume s is a positive number, so the target line is above the x-axis like I've illustrated here. The technique is basically the same if it was negative. Start the process by taking arrows from the list of up arrows in order of long to short, and string them one after another, tail to tip, until the tip of the last arrow is above the target line. As soon as this happens, start attaching arrows from the list of down arrows, again in order of long to short, until the chain falls below the target line. In this case, we only need to attach one down arrow before it falls below the line. Then switch again to adding up arrows until the chain goes above the line. Then switch back to attaching down arrows until it crosses the line again, and carry on this way forever. As you do so, the tail-to-tip sequence of the arrows will gradually close in on the target line. And that's it! As long as the chain never stops crossing the target line, each up arrow and down arrow will eventually be used. So there are no leftovers, and so the arrow chain we get represents a true rearrangement of the original series that now approaches S. A pretty elegant little trick, don't you think? In fact, maybe even a little too simple? Who am I kidding? This can't possibly work, can it? I mean, if this really could work, then wouldn't it work for any series, even the absolutely convergent series where it's not supposed to be possible? Alright, so yes, there are some loose ends to address here, but as you'll see, it turns out all the same that this trick, unmodified, really is all there is to it. And what's magical is how conditional convergence conspires to make everything work out perfectly, neatly resolving every difficulty. Alright, objection number one. Could you eventually run out of arrows to keep crossing the target line? For this strategy to work, we have to be able to cross the target line infinitely many times, and never have either the up arrows or the down arrows get so short so quickly that we can't cross the target line anymore. This may not seem possible at first, because we have an infinite supply of up arrows and down arrows, but actually, one of the central themes of infinite series is that this sort of thing can and does happen. I mean, that's what happens when an infinite series converges, right? For example, Consider the geometric series 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth, and so on, where each term is half the size of the previous one. If you started adding these terms up one by one, you would find the series would never exceed the number 2. This is because each time you add a new term, you close the gap between the previous partial sum and the number 2 only halfway, 
so you'll never be able to get past 2, and indeed, the sum of this series converges to exactly 2, and no more. So if our list of up arrows eventually started to look like this series, we could eventually run out of upward movement to keep crossing the target line, if the previous phase left us down too low. However, if that really happened, it would mean that the list of up arrows, or in other words, the list of positive terms, would form a convergent series when taken by themselves, meaning the sum of the positive terms alone would be some finite number p. But remember that the original series, with both the positive and the negative terms included, is also supposed to have a finite sum. We assumed it was conditionally convergent, remember? So if the sum of the positive terms is finite, then the sum of the negative terms also has to be finite. Otherwise, the series would diverge to negative infinity. Let's call the sum of all the negative terms by themselves n. But if that's the case, then the series can't actually be conditionally convergent, because if you make all of the negative terms positive, the sum of the series would have to be p plus the absolute value of n, which is finite. Thus, in order to be conditionally convergent, both the positive term subseries and the negative term subseries must be divergent when taken by themselves. This is good news because it means we have an unlimited amount of upward and downward movement at our disposal. So we will always have enough up arrows to cross the target line, and similarly for the down arrows. Alright, so we will always be able to cross the target line using strings of upward and downward arrows. But there's still another way the series might fail to converge to the target line. By oscillating too strongly above and below the line, and never actually closing in on it. This objection is kind of the reverse of the first one. There we were worried about not having enough upward and downward movement, now we're worried about having too much. But once again, conditional convergence saves the day. Or actually, I guess just the convergence part. Remember that since these arrows originally came from a convergent series, both the positive term sequence and the negative term sequence must be approaching zero, meaning the individual lengths of all the arrows, both upward and downward, must, in the long run, approach zero length. And since we always switch which direction the chain is traveling as soon as the first arrow of either type crosses the target line, we're guaranteed to have the chain's overall deviation from the target line shrink over time. If you're still not convinced, think about it this way. Consider the upward movement alone for now. In the worst case, each upward phase would be completed by landing exactly on the target line and then adding one more up arrow to fully cross it. This would result in the maximum possible upward deviation from the target line at the end of each upward phase. But nevertheless, since the upward arrows are getting shorter and shorter after each phase, and approaching zero length, the maximum upward deviation after each upward phase also has to shrink all the way to zero in the long term. And so there we have it! This strategy really does work, and gives you a way to build a new series, out of the terms of a conditionally convergent series, with its sum being anything you want. And isn't it amazing how conditional convergence gave us exactly what we needed to make this work? In a way, the conditional part allowed us to put to rest the concern that we would run out of upward and downward movement to keep crossing the target line. And the convergence part allowed us to be sure that the oscillation above and below the target line would eventually narrow in on the line itself. But actually, we can take this one step further. So far, I've presented the Riemann series theorem as saying that you can rearrange the terms of a conditionally convergent series to make it sum any real number you want, which is what we just proved. But actually, the theorem says something a little more. Not only can you change the sum to be any number by rearranging the terms, but you can even make the series diverge to positive infinity, or negative infinity, or just diverge by oscillation. Again, all just by rearranging the terms. Now, I won't go through the proof of that here. This video is already getting pretty long. Instead, I'll leave that part to you. See if you can find a clever way to use the arrows in these two lists to make an arrow chain that blows up to infinity, blows down to negative infinity, or just oscillates without ever closing in on anything. But remember that you have to use all the arrows, both upward and downward, in the series you construct, and not leave any leftovers. Feel free to share any ideas you have on how to do this in the comments below.
but if you can solve this extended puzzle on your own, I think you'll have developed some genuine intuition for the nature of infinite structures and processes, and how to analyze and reason with them. Beyond just being a fun little puzzle, the Riemann series theorem does tell us something of real mathematical importance. Essentially, the Riemann series theorem is telling you that conditionally convergent series are not well behaved, and should probably be avoided if you're trying to use infinite series to define some quantity that should be conserved under rearrangement of its components. For example, say you wanted to extend the definition of the dot product from vectors of just finitely many components to infinite sequences of real numbers. Remember the basic definition of a dot product means you multiply like components of your two vectors and add the results. If you extend this idea to infinite sequences, the dot product formula becomes an infinite series. However, one of the properties of the basic finite dot product is that its value shouldn't change if you rearrange the components of both vectors in sync because that ultimately just results in rearranging the terms in the dot product sum expression. Geometrically, this rearrangement essentially corresponds to relabeling your coordinate axes, which shouldn't affect the dot product of two vectors. So if you want to preserve this property when you extend the dot product from finite vectors to infinite sequences, you should probably restrict yourself to sequences whose dot products only result in absolutely convergent series. And indeed, this is exactly what mathematicians do to extend the dot product to infinite sequences. The special set of sequences we restrict ourselves to is called an L2 space. After seeing the Riemann series theorem proved, and you've gotten over the initial thrill, you might feel almost strangely deflated. Because when you step back, it's not as crazy as it first seemed. The starting series being conditionally convergent ultimately meant that you have an unlimited supply of upward and downward movement, along with an unlimited supply of arbitrarily small movement. When you think about it that way, it might seem almost inevitable that the Riemann series theorem be true. I mean, if you have an unlimited supply of upward and downward movement, which also contains arbitrarily small movements, of course you can use them to approach anything you want. And so what once seemed so bizarre and impossible, once you get a handle on what's really going on, might almost seem trivial. Having once tamed infinity, it loses its mystery. But actually, maybe that's even more strange. I find it surprising that infinite things can sometimes be so easily tamed. You wouldn't think that something so far beyond ordinary experience and the so-called real world as infinity would be so easily understood as often as it is. Now don't get me wrong, infinity is still plenty strange, and we definitely don't fully understand it. But all the same, I find it strange that, with a few simple tricks and a change in perspective, we can sometimes understand the nature of the infinite to the point it almost feels kind of humdrum. The fact that something as counterintuitive and, frankly, unbelievable as the Riemann series theorem can feel natural and almost obvious if you approach it the right way is honestly pretty astounding. 